Hi, I'm Jackie Martling. My brand new autobiography, The Joke Man, Bout of Stern, is being released. Go to JackieTheJokeMan.com. Great holiday gifts. Easy to wrap. I guarantee you are going to love this book. <laughs> Hi, this is Amy Stats from Eddie and Dave, and you're listening to Dave and Dave Unchained. Pick up the top seller, Van Halen Rising, how a Southern California backyard party band save heavy metal. The new book by Greg Renoff. Learn about the early history of one of America's most decorated rock bands. Renoff goes deep into the Pasadena roots of the Van Halen brothers, David Lee Roth, and Michael Anthony. Go to VanHalenRising.com, where you can get autographed copies of the book, t-shirts, guitar picks, beer koozies and more vanhalenrising.com also available at amazon.com check out the new podcast the rock quarry your place to hear in-depth interviews with some of rock's most colorful characters with your host entertainment journalist david j crible the rock quarry is available for free on spreaker and itunes you can check us out on facebook at the rock quarry podcast on twitter at Rock Quarry Pod on Instagram at The Rock Quarry Podcast or email us at The Rock Quarry Podcast at gmail.com. The Van Halen World Extravaganza Circus <laughs> Foreign Legion Traveling Gypsy Show live in front of your naked steaming eyes direct from Hollywood after nine months of no work. <laughs> and we're going to go around the world. We have a larger production than ever. We have a chrome light show. And, you know, we got several custom stages, custom built stages, and all new everything. Alex builds his own drums every year. Most people aren't aware of this. Ludwig sends him the slats and the glue, and he decides on the configuration and the tuning and etc. etc. Edward jimmies his own guitars together every year. Everything is new. Okay, Dave, you know what time it is. Mailbag. <laughs> Come on, finish it! <laughs> I just like to hear you beg. <laughs> Time again. <laughs> Every day he changes it. That's right, it's mailbag time again. What a bag of mail came in this month, Dave. Holy crap, I got one even just last night. We're piling them up. We're almost at 20. It's crazy, but they'll go quick because they're short. All so, right, let's start plowing through. Well, we'll plow through. We're going to start with James Pacheco. And he says, hey, you guys are awesome. Thank you for your Van Halen content. I'm having a hard time coming up with a question this month. How the hell do you guys do three hours when Van Halen doesn't give us any news? Thank you for what you do. And if you ever come to New Mexico, I'm buying dinner. Look at that, Dave. I mean, this is the first time we've been offered a dinner from uh, one of our listeners. I have already booked a flight. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it, James. We want to thank you so much for that kind dinner offer. The reason we can talk about Van Halen, it's pure passion for the band and a never-dying curiosity about their music and their soulful drama and all of their craziness that goes on. So as we can tell from this month's news, there's never-ending topics to talk about van halen so and we are on to letter number two who comes from dave moses who calls himself the fourth dave and he says addressing your previous discussions why no early live album releases and no push for legacy with commercial tie-ins where ozzy and aerosmith or acdc all have done it for their brand well, first I want to say that I am not a Hagar fan, but he showed every one of these guys how to brand. He says Ed's guitars have a strong legacy, and that's something that he cares about, and I'm sure Hagar's tequila billions helped push his guitar branding even further than he would have had already, because he saw what Sammy did, and Mike's hot sauce, and even Dave's tattoo stuff. By the way, sly of Dave to write a song called Tattoo, huh? Alex even has his own signature snare going on. Keep your eyes peeled for Wolfgang Soda coming soon. And Ed is a bit of a recluse, and Dave can be stubborn, but I'm sure it has a lot to do with the legacy 
I think Dave and Eddie are going to leave the audience wanting more and like to remain somewhat of a mystery. I do think they're going to reach legacy status soon, though. And for a few more tours and albums, they will at least bring on the Van Halen TV show like the Osbournes or even a movie or something like that. Maybe even Janie or Wolf would be the reason it happens, but I think they're starting to get it. What are your thoughts? Well, to be honest with you, Dave, unfortunately, I don't think so, and or else it would have happened by now. These guys have kind of passed their opportunity to take advantage of marketing themselves and their brand. It appears we are squeezing the end of the toothpaste tube here, and we're, we're trying to get a tour out of it for this summer, and God knows if anything else is going to come out. What do you think, Dave? Oh, I agree with you. I mean, these guys just don't do any of that kind of stuff, right? I mean, we've been saying that for a long time. So Absolutely. They just don't jump at opportunities like that for whatever reason. Number three letter comes from Bon Southall. He says, I love a good three-hour podcast. I never seem to get bored or feel the need to break it up and listen into it in sections, except for getting inside the head of Eddie Van Halen. Listening to Eddie talk beats any sleeping medication. My question is, that has been killing me for years, what exactly does David Lee Roth say during Girl Gone Bad at 2 minutes and 58 seconds? Love your work, Bon Southall from Australia. Well, Bon, we discussed this before, Dave. Remember this? This section. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. Right. This section right here. We really have no idea. It really sounds like Dave's scatting a little bit here and, and sort of making up lyrics on the spot. We don't have any transcription for it. And to be honest with you, I've tried so hard to make it out, and I have no idea what he's saying. If anyone knows, please <laughs> write in and tell us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we are on to letter number four from Gary Junling. And he says, great show. Hey, you commented on Bill McClintock's mashup of Mean Machine, which is Mean Street with Dancing Machine from the Jackson 5 and Van Halen. If you like that, I highly suggest a song called Let's Dance, Let's Shout. It's the Jackson 5 again mixed with Dio. But there's a special guitar solo in the middle I think you would like. Gary Junling. Well, yes, I heard that, and thank you so much, Gary, for sending that link. But I do think that Dancing Machine Mean Street works even better. What do you think, Dave? Oh, I agree. But I, I do think that guy does have a knack for mixing songs together that you wouldn't think would go. But somehow he makes it work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Number five letter comes from Liddell Wallace. Hey, guys, I just found a copy of an email from Val meaning Valor Bertinelli, posted on the old Van Halen mailing list from June 1998 pertaining to That's Why I Love You. This song was left off Van Halen 3, and I believe it was the hit missing from the album. Val and many others agree. Two of my favorite songs are In a Simple Rhyme and Women in Love were on the list for worst tracks. What a travesty. Liddell Wallace. Well, Liddell, thanks for sending the letter. I appreciate that. I think that song definitely should have been on Van Halen 3 without a question. Val talks about it extensively in the email that he sent us. Thank you so much for sending that. That was nice. This is at a time back in the day when Val was corresponding with the fans via the internet and an email system. And she was talking about Van Halen and Van Halen 3 at the time. I think it would have been key to put that on the album, especially instead of How Many Say I. You know that's why I love you, I you, I but I think, to be honest with you, Mitch Malloy's version of It's the Right Time was a better version. What do you think, Dave? I don't know that Mitch's version is better. They're both really about the same to me, and I think anything could have replaced How Many I Say I on that album. Oh, please, anything. But even um, 
But even That's Why I Love You or Mitch's version, I mean, those songs are okay, but they're just okay. They're nothing great. So yeah. I think whether it was on the album or not on the album, it wouldn't have, it wasn't like the saving grace that was going to make the album. Right. I just thought it was a little lighter in tone and it, and it could have used a little lightning, you know, have something a little poppy on there. I think it's good. I happen to love the Mitch song. I, I think that was kind of right in line with, with sort of the Sammy Van Hagar era. It really was. It was a nice pop tune, but that's that's my take on it. Letter number six comes from Eric Torbick. What up, guys? I think the what if segment is a great idea, and I'm not sure which answer I enjoy more. Dave's straight serious answer or Dave's annoyed reluctant answer. So I'll play along. What if they really recorded and released an all-star album like the idea they had in 1985 instead of Sam joining the band? What do you think that album would have been like? Other than the names the band kind of talked about, who else from 1985 would you have liked to hear sing with Van Halen? Have fun. Love the cast, and here's hoping to something in 2019 so we can stop this silliness. And that comes from Eric Torbeck. Well, Dave, I think it's another time for Dave and Dave's What If. Now it's time for What If with Dave and Dave. Shit, What If? What If? Dave Marconi's favorite segment, What If? What If, motherfucker? I don't do what ifs. So I am going to take a stab at this just for you, Eric. And as discussed, they talked about Phil Collins and Pete Townsend. Those were the names I remember. I don't think those guys would have worked with Van Halen, to be honest. So this is what I've done for you, my friend Eric. I have put together a list of 5150 songs paired with an all-star singer, and not all of them, because I did a good eight for you. I, I didn't count inside, because th that's not going to work. Okay, ready for this? Roger Daltrey as lead singer on 5150, the song. Brian Johnson from ACDC on lead vocals for Get Up. Steve Perry of Journey as lead vocals on Dreams. Robert Palmer as lead singer on Best of Both Worlds. Daryl Hall from Hall & Oates as lead singer on Love Walks In. Vince Neil from Motley Crue, lead vocals on Good Enough. Patty Smythe from Scandal as lead singer on Why Can't This Be Love. And the lead vocals on Summer Nights, Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin. How do you like that? What do you think, Dave? Wow, you're aiming high on that one, let me tell you. <laughs> this was tough for me beyond the fact I don't like what ifs. I because, know. Because Hinsight's always twenty twenty, and I'm thinking, all right, well, who sounds like Sammy? Right. But they probably wouldn't have approached it that way because they wouldn't have hired Sammy. Right. But I still think somebody like David Coverdale around that time mm, would be a good yeah, choice. Yeah, definitely. Or even D. Snyder. Oh, yeah. Well, that's interesting. You know, sure, or yeah. even Vince Neil. Yeah, I mentioned um, him. Yeah. For, right, for, you know, I, Vince Neil for good enough, I thought would have been great. Yeah, because I, I think Vince would have fit that mold in that, you know, he's not, you know, he's not a Pavarotti or a Freddie Mercury, but. Right. He's know, got a he's flavor. Got, but he's got, right. He's got right. flavor. He's got character. Yeah. So I, I think that he would be good for that kind of thing. Or Kevin Dubrow or mm. any, I like, I'm really, as you can tell, like, I'm really going for like, you know, who was like popular in like the early to mid 80s right, in right. terms of, of hair metal. That's good. And, and, and that kind of musical genre. Although, as you point out, it really was interesting. That's not who the band was going for right. at all. Right. They were really, mm -hmm. I mean, like Pete Townsend was like a really curious choice. Mm. Dave, but, how about uh, Phil Collins, for Christ's sake? That makes more sense to me. Yeah? Well, I think so. He was more. He was more of a popular singer at the time, and he could certainly do "Love Walks In." I mean, he could certainly sing anything and make it sound good. Come on, how awesome would Steve Perry be on Dreams? 
Oh, he'd be perfect. Oh, forget it. It would be like ridiculous. He'd be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, some well, and I remember. I think it was Rolling Stone had review had said that a lot of those songs on that album were journey like songs. Yeah, good point. Good point. So I think Steve Perry would be a good if if Eddie was right. Those kind of songs, kind of songs. Yeah, I think Steve Perry would be a great choice for that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So. An interesting concept, an interesting what if, don't ever do.